So in a COVID world, we've been focused on safety. Yet almost all of us choose to engage in activities from swimming in the sea to driving a car or having a bottle of wine that carry risks. In fact, more people died globally last year from alcohol than from COVID. So how do we assess what risks to take and how much time and resource to protect ourselves from future risk? While it looks as if vaccines will bring the COVID pandemic under control, the next pandemic is potentially just a virus away. Must we act urgently now to safeguard, safeguard the world further from a, a, a future catastrophe? Or should we assess this against other global risks and then the cost and the resource involved? Is our ultimate goal to eradicate risk? Or must we just accept that risk is unavoidable? Well, we've got a great panel to discuss this here. Beverly Taylor is a biochemist. Um, she's head of influenza and scientific affairs at Securus and is an expert on global vaccine production and the inner workings of the WHO. Ella Whelan is a political commentator and freelance journalist. Uh, her criticism of no platforming and 21st century feminism has caused her to clash with mainstream journalists on the BBC, Sky and Channel 4. And her first book is What Women Want, Fun, Freedom and an End to Feminism. Lawrence Phillips, who likes to be called Larry, is an Emeritus Professor of Deci Decision Sciences at the London School of Economics and a Director of Facilitations Limited. Uh, after a career beginning in electrical engineering and three years in the US Navy, Larry has become a leading expert in decision science with decades of experience studying risk. So, as you all know, the formula is that each of our guests here has three minutes to, to do a pitch on the first question, which is, in the context of the pandemic, how do we assess what risks to take and how much time and resource to protect ourselves from future risk? Beverly, I'm going to start with you. Okay, thank you. Um, as we all know, we've just come through a devastating pandemic, which isn't quite over yet. Had huge uh, impact on the economy as well as public health and, and um, social um, health. And, you know, I do believe that we've got to be prepared for that. Um, I think we need um, to be prepared. I think we need... Uh, robust surveillance of what viruses are emerging and I think we need robust health systems um, for everybody so that all the, the preparedness activities can be implemented. Um, I, I, I don't want to leave people with the impression that there is no preparedness because WHO actually um, works to um, carry out surveillance globally to look for emerging viruses and this is an ongoing program. I work on influenza and there are 155 labs worldwide in 125 different countries that year round, day after day, are um, carrying out surveillance for influenza viruses. Not only the seasonal viruses, but the emerging viruses. And those emerging viruses coming from, that can potentially cause a pandemic, come from the animal-human interface. So the surveillance at that interface is a real opportunity for us to pick something up really early so that we can start building the preparedness in. And governments have also been prepared. So if you look at the UK government, we have, um, we have like a risk register uh, for the UK and influenza is right up there at the top, uh, as it is in many other countries. And the UK government has got preparedness plans. The problem is they were really focused on a pandemic influenza and not for COVID-19. So um, we've had a contract with the UK since 2012 to supply vaccines if it was influenza. And we've got contracts with other countries. So this is something that, that has been thought about. And a lot of the things that were put in place that people won't be aware of at all, but um, actually got used for the COVID response. So the WHO preparation, the whole system, the whole network that they've got for influenza was actually used to carry out surveillance for COVID-19. So that's how we, knew, we know that the new variants are coming out. That's how we can develop new diagnostic kits, work on second generation vaccines. The same in the UK, you know, the robust supply chains, um, the stockpiles of vials and syringes. Um, and, and the fact that we have a vaccine that we make every year 
means that in the case of influenza, we could just have switched that over and made a vaccine much more quickly than we could for COVID because we already do that every year. Um, unfortunately, in this case, it happened to be COVID and not influenza, but still that preparedness made a difference. And I think we have to keep thinking about that. It's so important to be prepared for whatever comes our way. But if it's, if it's a respiratory virus or, or something else, a lot of the preparedness plans that we have already in place for influenza could be utilised uh, for a pandemic response. OK, that's interesting. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Uh, Ella? I think that the, there's practical questions about how you prepare um, to prevent against the, the negative ways in which risk can affect you. And Beverly, I completely agree with everything you've just said in relation to making sure there is the uh, materials there for us to prepare for a future pandemic. But I suppose what I might put forward is the question of politically how we deal with risk. Um, and I really think that you should, we should flip the question on its head that the balance for too long has been too far swayed in favour of preventing against risk rather than thinking about what we need to do to manoeuvre towards a life and a politics of greater freedom. And this balance between safety and being concerned with risk and freedom uh, has been very much tilted one way throughout the pandemic. Obviously, uh, in the early stages of the pandemic and when it was at it, the virus was at its worst, for very good reasons. And uh, doing preventative things like lockdown measures to help uh, protect NHS from being overrun or indeed protect the elderly from dying, as many of, the, as many of them did. Was a, was a beneficial balancing of that risk versus um, freedom sort of swaying. But I think that risk prevention, as we come out of the pandemic, we really have to think about the way in which we have pathologized risk. Have uh, We now consider risk to be insur an insurmountable challenge, something that we must almost and always prevent against. I mean, I know that there's a war going on, a bit of a kind of culture war going on about vaccine passports um, across Europe, but particularly in the UK, you know, the government flip-flopping on whether or not they're going to have it. That there being a very good example of where the idea of risk overcomes and the prevention of risk overcomes the need to think about civil liberties and freedom. But the, I think the crucial thing to think about when we're considering how important the idea of risk is, or maybe the beneficial parts of risk, is to understand that this phenomenon of us uh, dealing with risk as a kind of an evil, something to be warded off, hasn't just fallen from the sky during the pandemic. It's actually come out of political trends that have been long in the making. So they, uh, you know, kind of from sort of banal things, if you want to think of it in a banal way, like uh, anti-smoking laws or interventions in relation to public health, being about pathologizing risk at the expense of individual freedom, there's been that trend. Uh, on a more political level, throughout the pandemic, there's been, the government has implemented bans on protest, bans on freedom of speech online in the way in which coronavirus or vaccines or whatever can be talked about. And that has happened uh, for decades previously through institution, you know, in bans on um, freedom of speech and freedom of debate. I mean, the current police crime um, prevention bill that's pretty much Priti Patel cracking down on protest is all part of that sense of risk involves trusting people to make decisions. And what we really are saying in society is that we can't trust people to make decisions. There's the kind of practical aversion to risk you know, that we, we should police what people eat in case there's the risk that if they're allowed to eat what they want, they become a drain on the NHS and are obese and fat. There's a psychological aversion to risk. You know, we've, we often talk about, particularly in education, the risk of marking kids work with a red pen or telling them that they're wrong or disciplining them in case it causes some kind of psychological harm along the way. And then, as I've already mentioned, there's the political risk. I mean, I was just on a panel yesterday about dissent and democracy. One of the biggest problems we have in contemporary politics is a, is a misbelief in trusting people to take risks when it comes to political opinions, to try out dis discussions, to try out ideas in free debates. We, what we want to do is flimp risk on its head and think sensibly about it and think that one of, you know, what Beverly mentions, one of the most amazing things to come out of this pandemic has been the vaccine. And I'm no epidemiologist or a scientist and know anything like that. I know a little bit from being a St. John's Ambulance volunteer vaccinator, a tiny bit. But the, you know, the whole exciting thing about that is that taking risks and innovating in the world of science, for example, is part of progress. You can't experiment, you can't make mistakes, you can't learn lessons unless you inherently embrace the positives of risk. So I think we should think about what, what shunning risk and, sh and embracing safety in expense of freedom leaves us in terms of political change and progress in society. Thanks very much. Larry. 
Well, I have a problem about all this because you're talking about taking risks. I, actually, you don't take risks. I don't set out to take risks. What I do is I make decisions, and you said that, Ella. We take decisions, not risks. Risks are a consequence. So why, what, what did I make, what choices did I make in the light of COVID? Well, when we take decisions, we take decisions because we want to make something better. We have a, a goal, an objective. And my objective, my fundamental objective, is to stay alive. So I have another objective, and that's to help other people. As a decision analyst, I do a lot of that. So I decided, yes, I would get vaccinated, right? So I've helped myself to stay alive, and I've helped you to stay alive as well. I don't see that there can be any doubt about that, but obviously there is in some people's minds. And that may be because they have different objectives. So I think we have to look at the objectives of what it is we're trying to, to, uh, to do. And you, you talked about political objectives and other objectives. Yes, they're all these. But fundamentally, what do we do? We take decisions. Let me tell you a little quite short story. My father smoked most of his life. When he was 70 years old, my sister, who was a nurse, took him through the emphysema ward of the local hospital. And as he left, he turned to her and said, oh my God, there are better and worse ways to die. <laughs> he quit smoking immediately and lived to be 96. Oh, brilliant. So, so he had another objective, which was the quality of his life. And we take decisions to do those things. We don't take risks. We accept risk amounts but let's focus on what we should be doing and what the objectives are that we are looking at. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.